for us to look back and forwards. And I will start with looking forwards, Azerbaijan. What are your thoughts on that another oil-rich nation hosting COP? Well, it used to be that the, we had a sort of rhythm of a big COP every five years. Um, but I think since, since Glasgow, it feels like every, every COP's a big COP. There's no doubt that Azerbaijan will be somewhat overshadowed by other political events. Yes, it feels like for, just the week after the US election. Yeah, for many people, it's more of a stepping stone to Brazil, um, which will be the, the COP where new national plans need to be committed. But it's a, this is a process of continual ratchet. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't over-index on the fact that it's an, it's an oil and gas okay. country. A lot of people were, were, were disappointed about the, the Emirates being a, a, a big oil and gas producer, but then Dr. Sultan ended up was pushing for another ratchet, you know, for phase, phase down of fossil fuels. So I think I focus on the content more than the, and, and people tend to rise to the occasion, right? It's quite, it'd be quite difficult to take this presidency role and then try and damp down ambition when, when, when the eyes of the world are on, are on you. It's, and it's an opportunity to shine, right? And, that, and the way to shine now is by moving the process forward. Okay. So the momentum is there. There's no need to worry that things might suddenly, there might suddenly be a... Well, I think there are, there are other reasons to worry about why things might slow down, but I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that Azerbaijani presidency is at the top of the list. So let's follow the thread then back a little way. You were involved with COP26. Um, talk us through that and what was the kind of key there and how has that played out as we've gone along? I mean, I think that the two keys which are kind of related to COP26, the one, remember, it was the closure of the Paris rule book. I joked about this earlier that Laurence Fabius, when he presided over the closing plenary in Paris, had to, had to gavel through one decision, which is the adoption of the Paris Agreement. Yeah. If, you, if you watch the video of Alok Sharma presiding over the final plenary, his gavel is up and down about 100 times. There were a lot of detailed decisions about uh, how countries report, about how Article 6 on carbon markets, and on and on and on, which, which was the rule book which had been not finalized but pointed to in Paris. It took five years to do that. So that, that closure has taken us into the next stage. And the other thing that COP26 did more than ever before was bring the public and private sector together to really start this dynamic of how can we kind of encourage each other and support each other, public and private, mm. in raising the bar and turning that, turning that into action. Mm. And, and, and that's, that, that dynamic's continued and has become more and more a central part of every COP now. And that's been referred to already uh, by the head of UN Climate Change, who's told countries that they need to look even more creatively at how to deliver that public-private partnership. Yeah, because we, we know that... Um, of course we need regulation, but governments will always have an eye of their left shoulder to their citizenry and their right shoulder to the business community. So when the business, businesses step up, they, they open up the political space to be bolder, and then, and then of course vice versa. So you see the language from Simon Steele, who I think is the first um, executive secretary of the UNFCCC, who actually comes from a private sector background, is more about real economy um, dynamics of public and private, although, of course, he's still presiding over a very complex negotiation process. Tell us what it's like being there in those very complex negotiations. Well, you know, it's, it, depends where you, it, it, it depends where you are, but then, I mean, the negotiations are kind of boring, right? Because, because they're about nearly 200 countries pouring over every line of text in many, many, many different facets, and it's a culmination of a it's what was a stepping stone in a process that's been going on for nearly 30 years now, right? or, uh, um, or well, it will be 30 years, won't it, because we missed, missed a year. So, um, so it's, 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 it's a bit like no one ever, no one ever what, I mean, how many people turn in to watch the committee stage of a bill going through the Houses of Parliament, right? The same thing happens in all lawmaking processes. There's a lot of attention to detail and occasional spikes of drama. Um, occasionally the process is hijacked as it was at the end of COP26 with this little watering down drama from the Indians and the Chinese. Um, but mostly, mostly it's, it's a hard graft and there's a lot of, lot of people working very hard. And, and one of the interesting things is that there's of course the dynamic between countries, mm -hmm. uh, but then there's two other dynamics that you often forget. One is that every negotiating team is also negotiating with their country at home. Like they have, they're going to have to land a message politically to whatever their system is. Um, but also there's a sort of camaraderie amongst the negotiators. Even if they're taking bits out of each other in the negotiating process, you'll see it occasionally 
when, when a big piece of the process reaches a hiatus, like when the Article 6, the carbon markets rule book was finalized in Glasgow, all of the negotiators were kind of celebrating on stage because it's, they, you know, they, they, they get to know each other as humans and they know that the positions that individuals are taking is not necessarily an individual position, but a political position that they have to represent. So there's lots of different dynamics. And those personal relationships, I think, are in many ways the most important thing to allow us to transcend the pettiness sometimes of individual political positions to deliver what we really need. And that was very present certainly at the end of Paris and I'd say again at the end of Glasgow. I mean, it's obviously a practical and very symbolic moment when we see hopefully these countries coming together with the next element of the, the roadmap. Um, we were talking one of the discussions earlier about the fact that there isn't that sort of joined up really practical, pragmatic, ongoing conversation between nations about how the world works in lockstep to deliver the change that we need. It's too disparate. Well, I, I, I don't think that's true. Okay. Um, I think that, that conversation does, because it's not perfect, but it does happen, but not in the COPs. Yeah. Remember, the Conference of the Parties is run by environment ministers. Environment ministers. Yeah. They have basically none of the levers to transform the energy system, which is finance ministers, energy ministers, industry ministers, maybe planning ministries, depending on the, on, on, on the country. So we also have to remember the limitations of the COP, but, but again, since, since, since Glasgow, we now have a lot of multi, you know, we launched the, the, the breakthrough agenda in Glasgow. That's now 54 countries covering about 80% of emissions who've agreed to collaborate on the main sectors. So EVs, power, steel, shipping, etc. to get the technology to be the least cost technology by 2030. So then it becomes a sort of natural adoption for anyone who's investing in that technology. So that's, that's quite sophisticated. IEA, IRENA and the UN champions published an annual report on that. There's also very sophisticated private sector collaboration around all of those hard to abate sectors and in, in the energy side, the Global Renewables Alliance came together to support the trebling of renewables and doubling of energy efficiency as it on the private side and then G7, G20 and the COP echoed that ambition on the private side. So I, I actually think that that architecture is increasingly in place in a way that there was virtually nothing five years ago. Okay. So not perfect, but, but increasingly that's a part of the way that we get things done. Getting and better. that doesn't just come together at COP, that's an ongoing process. Okay. Um, and on the, the, the innovation, how much of a prize is there for those who deliver the breakthroughs and deliver the technology that is going to be required? And, and where are we kind of placed in that area as a we country? We the UK? Yeah. Well, I would, say, I would say probably the biggest switch in the, in the sort of mainstream conversation about the energy transition in the last five years is that it's increasingly become one of a competitive landscape. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's an environmental argument. Yes, there's an intergenerational justice argument. Yes, there's a north-south justice argument. But increasingly, I think governments and businesses are seeing that this is definitely happening. Uh, it's happening faster and faster and faster in each, in each sector at different, different rates. Um, and if you get behind that exponential curve, it's almost impossible to catch up. And you know, this, the history of technology transitions is full of incumbents who thought they had a right to run the sector forever, were slow in the transition, and then we've forgotten their names yeah. now. So, I mean, you see that particularly now with the difference between China's world leading position in sector after sector after sector, you know, wind, solar, um, batteries, EVs, um, uh, critical minerals, because it's been driving this transition harder and faster, because it's been having to build its energy system. We've been maintaining our energy system roughly, so we haven't had to drive really fast innovation. Um, and I think we've seen now the US waking up with the Inflation Reduction Act and Europe waking up to the fact that this is a, an inevitable transition that has competitive mm -hmm. consequences. And now, for example, you see the European car manufacturers are scared because they know they're being outcompeted cost-wise yeah. by Chinese car manufacturers. And so selling a few luxury EV cars to those who can afford it is not a way to make a transition and they're already losing market share to the Chinese. And, and where does the UK sit then in terms of the, you know, where we're leading on innovation or just not, well, not I mean, you, getting there? 
I mean, UK's got a mixed track record. We did, a, we did a really good job. We've done a really good job of pioneering, particularly offshore wind, although we haven't captured many, much of the supply chain benefit from that. Most of that wind is owned by, by overseas investors, and even the supply chain, even if it's in the UK, it's usually a foreign company. Um, uh, you know, I think we're doing, we're doing, you know, we don't have an, any indigenous car com company. I mean, we have car manufacturing, but we don't have UK owned companies, but, but we're doing okay. Policy signal wobbles like the one we've just had don't help. But you know, we'll, we've, got, we've got gigafactories being built, one in Somerset, one in, um, up in Sunderland. We've got all those car manufacturers transitioning. Um, I don't know uh, if the confusing signals from the Prime Minister recently will slow people down. I think the transition in the UK and Europe is pretty much guaranteed to happen by 2035, so probably not put off. The question now is in other sectors like um, you know, storage and green hydrogen and the built environment where we've been, we've been very slow and in, and, in, and in food and land. I mean, one, one of the hats I wear now is on the board of the UK Infrastructure Bank, and it is encouraging to see um, smart leverage of UK public money to invest in um, businesses that are driving the transition in the UK. Explain a bit about how you're seeing that working. Well, the, I mean, the, the idea of the UK Infrastructure Bank is it's 22 billion pounds of public money. Um, to be invested in the transition and in regional economic development, but 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 not to not to not competitively with private money. So it's all about crowding in the private sector. So um, James Emmett, the CEO, was on stage earlier explaining that unlike most banks, the UK Infrastructure Bank will happily reduce its share of a deal as the deal progresses, because and the ultimate objective in a way would be to have it all be private. Because we know we know we need so much more investment than any public. Um, uh, uh, coffers can cope with. So the real, and this is true in the UK, it's true in the States, it's true in the whole world, that we need a massive leverage of limited public funds to bring in the private sector. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the Infrastructure Bank will invest in debt, equity and, and, and guarantees to uh, take a bit of the risk away from the private sector and allow the private sector to come in with a bit more confidence, a bit earlier than they would have done otherwise. Yeah, and on that, you mentioned the, the messaging from the government. I mean, business likes certainty. And uh, we heard from the energy secretary today saying, too many targets damage business. They don't want to do that. They want the market to effectively lead. How helpful is that? What impact does that have? Well, I mean, that, I mean, I'll be too rude. Um, it's okay. You're a... I don't. I don't. I mean, I didn't. I didn't hear. I didn't hear her remarks, right? Yeah. But I think. I think. Of course, too many targets and confusing targets, but more importantly, changing targets is really not good for business. Not good to attract investment. Um, but but the, so, so, similarly, no targets is terrible. We we kind of tried that. I, mean, I, I used to work in industry. I, work, I ran a business. We were based based in Germany. German, the Germans could never understand the kind of um, Reagan Thatcher laissez faire. Le mm -hmm. which just led to manufacturing leaving these shores. It's one of the reasons we don't have any car, com car of our own car companies anymore, whereas mm. uh, Germany does, because Germany had a very different, they, they still had an industrial strategy. So this idea that, that, that we can't have a strategy is an abdication of responsibility. Um, I, and let me give you a very concrete example of a surprise signal from the private sector wanting clarity. Um, the UK government initially had a 2040 phase out date for combustion engines, and then as, that, as it became obvious to the UK with the advice of the Climate Change Committee that it would be possible to go faster. The government consulted widely industry on bringing that date forward to 2032 or 2035. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the very loud response from business was, do it earlier, do it by 2030. Mm -hmm. Including Ben Van Buren, the then CEO of Shell. Mm -hmm. Surprising that someone would, you know, it's like a turkey voting for Christmas, mm -hmm. shut down this bit of my business early. Mm -hmm. When he was asked why he had this opinion, it was, because it will give us clarity. We know this market is going to transition, but we have to guess when, because we don't have certainty. So a, a, a final end date, yeah. um, as long as it's not crazy, is very helpful. We, you know, we will burn the last lump of coal in this country this year. You know, in, in this country and in Europe, we will sell the last combustion engine in the early 2030s. That clarity is very helpful for everybody to make decisions about how they manage the transition. And the lack of that clarity just means we waste money guessing. So business likes clarity, they don't like changes of, of signal, and they don't like um, conflicting signals. The other really important thing is that the supporting policies along the way are appropriately helpful. So for example, in solar we had feed-in tariffs at the beginning, now we have contracts for difference in wind. In, in, with heat pumps we have an increased um, 
fiscal support to early adopters. Mm -hmm. That won't be needed forever, but it's helpful to get the market going because yeah. markets won't necessarily, they will not make that transition from high cost to high volume, low cost without the right policy support. Why do you think then that if you're saying that business has indicated in sort of key moments, it likes those targets, why isn't the government doing that? Well, the, I mean, the government, look, we're, 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 we're in a weird political phase where we're six months away from an election and the, and the current government is dying in the polls. So they're looking for things to try and gain some momentum. So, so far, all their attempts to um, wobble on, on climate policies don't seem to have had any positive effect. But, but, so I can only think that they're either chasing the reform vote or trying to find a wedge issue, but it doesn't seem to be working. And it's certainly not helpful for business. What business wants is clarity, consistency, and support at the appropriate phase in the transition. Are we on course for net zero by 2050, which is legally enshrined in this country? Yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're not. I mean, we've done, it is true that the UK is the first major economy to halve our emissions compared to 1990. We've done an amazing job. That's mainly been through um, decarbonizing the, the power system, a combination of gas to coal, and then, and then a, and a good ramp up of renewables. Um, but as the Climate Change Committee's uh, annual progress report said the year before last and last year, we're not on track with the policies to make the next step. There's a lot of red and amber lights um, all, all over the report. Um, two years ago, the report said there was, also wasn't enough detail. The government then provided more detail and that made us more worried because the increased detail showed us that actually there was even less um, substance in the policy. And since then, we've had some further winding back of policy on, um, on buildings, on heat, and on, on, uh, on EV. So we're, we're, we're off track in terms of the policy readiness for the next phase. The Climate Change Committee will make its recommendation for carbon budget seven, which takes us through to 2042 in early next year. And the expectation would be that the government accepts that advice, because governments always have so far. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uses that as the basis of the UK NDC to go to the UNFCCC ahead of the, the Brazil COP. And hopefully early and bold to set a tone for the rest of the world that the UK is ratcheting, because that's the requirement of Paris that every NDC should be bolder than the last one. How optimistic or otherwise do you feel about where we are headed as a, as a country and as a world? Well, it's, it's always mixed, right? I mean, I'm very confident that um, the technology, the, the, the pattern of exponential adoption of new technologies will drive us to net zero in energy, transport, and industry quicker than almost anybody can imagine today. It's very hard cognitively to understand how exponential change works. But we'll, you know, the last combustion engine will be sold in about 10 years' time. We'll fully decarbonize power next decade. Um, there are some trickier areas. Um, you know, the built environment we've done a bad job of in this country, that needs to be driven by standards. Um, but, but the technology's there to do it. But then the food and agricultural system is complicated because it's cultural. Um, yeah. the, the farmer lobby are, um, are, are very strong and, and worried rightly about, whether, the, about, about how to, whether that change will be navigated in a way that, they, in, that is helpful for them. Has that effectively been sort of left to one side? Yeah, well, if you, if you look at our progress to date, really it's food and land where we've made no progress. So that will become increasingly the focus of the, of, of the Climate Change Committee and the government in the, in the years to come because it's the area where we haven't unlocked. I think the, the other, just, just sort of globally, the other big thing we have to crack is the mobilization of finance in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. um, we, we commissioned Nick Stern and Vera Songway to write a report on, on what's the whole, you know, there's this 100 billion that has rather overcaptured our imagination in the COP process. This is the risk of thinking that the COP is the world. It's mm -hmm. not. Um, and they, they did a sort of engineering review of what do we actually need. We need $2.4 trillion a year investment in emerging markets, excluding China, by 2030. That's four or five times the levels now. Um, half of it needs to come from the private sector. A lot of it needs to be generated locally. Um, and we need more from the multilateral development banks. But if we don't do that, then the consequences in terms of um, human and economic suffering, mm -hmm. um, and then geopolitically what that does in terms of changing the politics in Europe and North America, if we start seeing a lot of climate migration, um, that starts to be really worrying in terms of what that might lead to. So we'll wrap up by me giving you the magic wand and you tell us what you would like if you could just wave that wand. 
Well, I would like um, you know, next year every, every major economy to come out with a, uh, a new nationally determined contribution, a new plan, which is aligned with 1.5 degrees, so it gets to net zero by 2050. Mm -hmm. um, that has very clear um, targets for phasing out coal, for 100% renewable grids, and for phasing out combustion engines. Um, and, and also indicates the policy support for the transition in the areas which are earlier, so green steel, green hydrogen, mm -hmm. green shipping. Um, and that the, um, the private sector start taking emerging markets much more seriously than they are at the moment. There's a bit of an excuse that it's too difficult or that the World Bank hasn't done enough. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think I'd like to see more private finances getting on planes to go to Africa and Latin America and Southeast Asia and seeing that there are perfectly investable businesses there if you do the hard work mm -hmm. and, there, and there are good returns mm -hmm. to be done if you do the hard work and you do the right structuring. Great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Nigel Topping. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.